am the State Equine Extension Specialist. I'm Dr. Betsy Green, and I am in Tucson, Arizona. And we decided that with our lovely COVID situations and no face-to-face -face extension, we tried to put together some good things for our 4-H and other youth and adult and other interested parties, some webinars that have some good content, but even more importantly, how you can apply that content to your situation. And we wanted to focus on animal projects. So we have already done rabbits and what was our second one? We did horses, rabbits, swine, and now we have chickens. Next up is beef. So what I'm going to do is uh, go through a couple things. I'll th show you a couple of websites and then we will go from there and we will kick off this presentation. So tonight we have excellent eggs with Ashley Wright and she is our extension livestock area agent out of Cochise County. We will finish up with Josh Moore, our 4-H agent in Pima County and he will be, I think, maybe bringing on a volunteer to talk about, finish up with what the 4-H poultry project is about. But let's just do a couple of quick rules. And this one should be pretty easy, but you say it and then you're done with it. So all participants are muted and they don't have cameras since this is a webinar situation, not a meeting. And so you'll have the option of communicating either via the chat box, which many of you are telling us about your chickens and where you're from, or the question and answer box. Now, if you, if you, um, I'll show you, Josephine, I see your question. I'll show you that in a minute. You are jumping the gun. <laughs> but if you um, have a question, put it in the question and answer box. If it's something that applies right now and I say, hey, Perhaps Ashley can answer that. I'll interrupt and say, hey, you had a question about this if she doesn't see it. If it's something that she can address later or it's not, you know, it doesn't fit where she's talking, we'll get to it. It just might not be right away. So you can just type it once and we'll let you know if it's gonna be answered live or not. And then chat, again, we're chatting about chickens. <laughs> so this, this is a learning environment here. If you are typing, please clearly type any questions. Questions will be addressed, be patient. Of course, be polite and respectful in the chat. And the recording will be available at a later date on the website that I'll show you in a little bit. And it'll just get front and end ed edited just a little bit, but it just fits into the workload of the person that does that for us. And then of course, certainly we won't have any issue, but there's any inappropriate or harassing behavior, you will be removed, but we don't wanna do that and we don't want you to do that. So this is AZ Ag at Home, Learn, Do, Teach is the theme, but there's something even better. You can actually earn and learn. This is something that we're just putting out this time. And so if you, adult or youth, doesn't matter, 4-H or not, if you attend five or more of these AZ4-H Ag at Home webinar series, then you can earn a free t-shirt and you've got a little mock-up on the left. This, But you must attend the live sessions. And if you've already attended the past ones live, then in fact, you will be eligible for the t-shirt as well if you attend five. So if you attended all three and this is your fourth, then you're getting close. After the series, registered attendees will receive an overall survey. After filling it out, there'll be a place to check the uh, webinars that you attended live, request a size, and then provide a mailing address as well. We're going to order them after we get your sizes so we can get you the sizes that you guys need or and want. And if you teach, if your check boxes match the data that we have for attendees, then probably six to eight weeks, you'll get a nice surprise at no cost to you in your mailbox. So again, this is youth and adults. And so it's just kind of a cool thing that we thought would be fun to do. All right, so I am going to show you, come on. 
I'm gonna go to, see if I can find the right one here. I thought it was up. All right, I'm just gonna move here. Okay, you see my webinar thing? So if you go, you can see my cooperative extension. Yes, okay, thanks Josh. So this is just the front page, extension.arizona.edu. Couple of different ways you can find what the webinars are, jo Jolene, don't know. What, um, Josephine. Josephine, thank you. I, I knew Jolene wasn't right. You go here and you say, oh, okay, 4-H home. Woohoo! Click on that. Say, huh, Arizona 4-H virtual programming. You click on that. Like, wow, look at these excited people. Oh, oh recognize that. That's going to be my t-shirt. Click on that and you have chickens on this one. And here's all the things with all the links to register. So you can register and they're different links because we, we get have the data separated for that. But registering for chickens right here. And look at that bonus. Okay, click here for more information. And you can just see the t shirt right there. You can also see um, past webinars in this series. So we have the link right there and scroll down there's animal projects horse webinar swine rabbits and there's some other ones too that have been done when we first started the covid stuff so you can take a look there all right so now if you say okay whoops there's your shirt how else can i go extension.arizona.edu slash horse takes you to this page and so if you take a look you got 4-h got publications, you got all kinds of info. There was a rabies webinar earlier today. Here's our ag at home stuff. Also have the, if you're a horsey person with your chickens, there's also January 23rd and 4th, there's online free uh, because it's COVID, otherwise it would be in person, uh, equine health symposium. Okay, so we also will be having for other horse interests, Parasites in the Horse, an Informed Arizona Equestrian Webinar Series. Okay, so if you see this, you know that it's Air University of Arizona Equine Extension, but that just gives you a little intro to some of the things that um, are available to you right now. And there's more too, feel free to look around. But right now, let me introduce Ashley Wright. She has been and uh, you can share your screen, right? Yeah, but you have to stop sharing first. Oh, details, details, there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> and she has been with Extension for, she's in her fifth year. Yes. So in your sixth year. Fifth year, it'll be five and a half. It'll be six in July. Five and a half years. And she has got done a lot of cool stuff while she's been here. You'll meet Josh later, and then Ashley Jefford Sample is also on here too. We, but tonight, how chickens lay eggs, what can go wrong, how you can make sure your eggs are safe to eat. So Ashley will take off, and I will kind of be monitoring chat and questions. All right, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Perfect. All right, guys, so today we're gonna talk about eggs how chickens make them, what can go wrong when chickens make them. You know, we get those weird eggs, the rubber ones or the ones with the weird shells, why that happens, how we can make sure that our eggs don't look like that and um, which, how to make sure our eggs are safe to eat. We'll do that a little bit at the end. So let's get started. Never wants to go the first time. There we go. So first off, why do chickens lay eggs? What do you guys think? Drop me in the chat why you think chickens lay eggs. What, what purpose egg laying serves? What do you guys think? To reproduce, yeah. For their system to be cleared, okay. To make more, yep, that you guys got it, that's it. It's not to make food for us, it's to make more chicks, right? It's to, that's how they reproduce. So what, um, when we talk about eggs, let's talk real quickly about what the different parts of the egg are. So um, this is, our eggs. So this would be the shell. This would be the albumin or what's called the white part of the egg. 
the egg white. So you know how when you crack an egg um, into a bowl and sometimes you have those two little white ropey looking things? So that's this chalasa, this stuff right here. These are actually just egg white that is used to keep that egg yolk, which is the part that the embryo uses for food, centered in the middle of that egg. That's what keeps that yolk centered. You don't want the yolk resting up against the eggshell because that will interfere with the chick developing properly. So this is the yolk, and this is actually the part that contains the little itty bitty chicken DNA that will eventually become a baby chick if that egg is fertilized and if we incubate it. So what do you guys think? Do you have to have a rooster for chickens to lay eggs? What do you guys think? I see yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, so it's a little bit of a trick question here. No, you do not have a roost, need to have a rooster for chickens to lay eggs. Chickens will lay eggs even without a rooster, but if you want eggs that will hatch, that's eggs that are fertile that you can get baby chicks from, yes, you do have to have a rooster. So a little bit of a trick question there. Okay, so this is the squeamish part, which I forgot to warn you guys about, I'm very sorry. Um, I do have some pictures like this in here, but let's talk really quickly about the parts of the chicken's reproductive tract. Now that we've talked about the parts of the egg, let's talk about the reproductive tract. So this is an entire chicken's reproductive tract, all pulled out and labeled for you. So starting right here, this is the ovary of the chicken. Now, most animals have two ovaries, they come in a pair, but in chickens, only one ovary actually develops to produce eggs. And that's pretty unusual because in every other species, usually both ovaries actually produce eggs. But in chickens, and it's almost always the left ovary. So this is the ovary. These, what do you guys think these are? What do these look like? Type that in the chat for me, what you think those look like. They're yellow, they're round, they have to do with eggs. What do they look like? Well, they're oh, that's right. While they're typing something in, Ashley, somebody had said, hey, it kind of like a human cell, correct? From your last chat question. What, um, what, was the, what was the last one? Um, I think when you were talking about the DNA, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm telling them to put that stuff in the active chat. <laughs> oh, okay. But they were referring, saying it's kind of similar to a human cell. Yes, it's exactly, exactly like a human cell. That, that's actually called the ova, which is the little part of the egg. In chickens, it's a little complicated because we call the whole thing, shell and everything, an egg. But in reality, the true egg is the actual part that contains the DNA, and that's that tiny little white um, germ disc that's on the yolk, that little tiny white spot. And if you crack an egg and look for it, you'll actually find one. And that is very analogous to the same ova or eggs that all other species produce off of their ovaries. Yes, that's right. And so these are yolks, and the yolks don't actually have the DNA. These are actually composed of stuff that the little growing chick embryo will use to nurture itself to, to get the nutrients it needs to grow and develop properly. Um, normally, if this was a mammal where that little baby was growing in a uterus, it would get that stuff from mom. But since what's gonna happen is this chicken is gonna lay this egg and then the chick is gonna develop, she has to make sure that that little baby chick has everything it needs in its egg to grow and develop since she's not gonna be able to give it to it. Okay, so we have, this ovary, and we're going to look at this a little bit more in depth in a second. We have the whole rest of the chicken reproductive tract here, which we're going to talk about, ending in the cloaca, which is the part where the chicken expels the egg from her body. So let's talk really quickly. I never want to go forward for me. There we go. Let's talk really quickly about this ovary a little bit more closely. So we have a lot of parts here, okay? So we can think of this little ovary. So this, this is the, actually the ovary here. And all these little spots are what are called immature follicles. And each one of those little follicles has one of those little ova, those little eggs associated with it. And those ovas grow and develop. And pretty soon they get this big, and then they're this big until they get mature ovum or mature size here. This is an ovum that's ready to be released and will become the yolk of the egg. So it takes one of these little follicles about 10 days to grow from this size to this size and be ready to be released. And these are growing continuously all the time. So this one is, let's say this one's 10 days and she's gonna lay this egg today. 
This might be at nine days. So this might be tomorrow's egg. This might be Friday's egg. This one would be Saturday's egg. This one would be Sunday's egg. By the time we get to Sunday, this one is gonna be this size and be ready to go. And some more of these little follicles here will have grown up to be this size so that they can go a few days later. So in this way, we have this continuous process of how a chicken lays an egg about every day. So it takes about 10 days for these yolks to go from this size to big enough to be released and be ready to go to the next step of the process. So we talked about that ovary and that all animals have ovaries and that some do like chickens do and lay eggs. So what other types of critters do you guys think lay eggs? There's other, others, what other animals lay eggs? There's a whole bunch. Snakes, I see snakes, yep. Ducks, geese, birds, platypus, yes. Lizards, turtles, great, you guys have got it, yes. So those animals all lay eggs and, and that's in comparison to what are called mammals with the exception of the platypus, which is the only mammal that lays an egg. Um, they give birth to live young, whereas chickens lay eggs. Okay, so how, uh, we talked about that. Let's go on to the next slide, let's go back. Let's go back to this again and take a look at what happens next. So when we start with these little eggs and they grow up into their big yolks with their little germ on them and they get released, they get caught right here. This is called the infundibulum, which is a very funny word. Um, basically, it's like a big funnel that it catches that egg and guides it into the reproductive tract. This whole thing is actually called the oviduct. And its whole purpose is to take this egg through the whole process to making it an egg where it can be excreted. So the infundibulum is the first piece that sort of catches it. And as it moves into what's called the magnum, that's where we add the white. So all that white, egg whites that are a part of that egg, those get added here in the magnum. And they do provide a little bit of nutrition to the baby chick, not as much as the yolk does, but a little bit, but it also really serves as a way to keep that yolk centered and to keep um, help kind of protect that growing embryo a little bit. So once that egg has had its whites added, it gets a membrane added um, here in what's called the isthmus. So this, um, if you've ever had a rubber egg born, and we're gonna talk about rubber eggs laid, born laid, um, a rubber egg laid that had no shell on it. Those are the membranes that are added in the isthmus. And what happened was that egg skipped the next step. So those membranes get added and then the egg progresses further down into the shell gland, which as you can imagine, adds the shell. So that adds that calcium thick, heavy layer that makes our tough egg shells. It continues down the process and around in here, it'll get pigmentation added. So if your hens lay colored eggs, if they lay green eggs or brown eggs, anything other than a white egg, that's where that pigmentation is gonna be added. And that's why when you have green eggs, that's why only the shell is green and not the inside, which is very disappointing, I know, to all of us who loved green eggs and ham. It's just the shell that's green, um, but all that pigmentation gets added here. And then the shell goes into the cloaca and the hen lays it. And so there will be multiple eggs at different processes sort of along this thing. It takes um, about 24 to 26 hours for a hen to lay an egg from the time that yolk is released until it reaches all the way down and she lays it. So that means that a hen actually doesn't quite usually lay one egg a day, right? If she's laying an egg every 24 to 26 hours, she might lay at 8 a.m. today and 9 a.m. tomorrow and 10 a.m. the next day. And eventually what'll happen is she'll skip a day and go back to the beginning. So that's why you don't quite get an egg a day out of most hens, but you can get pretty close. So okay. one thing we asked is, they still lay, lay eggs in the winter, right? They do still lay eggs in the winter. However, it slows down quite a bit. So the whole egg laying process is driven by this little gland that actually sits kind of in the front of their brain behind their eyes called the pineal gland. And that gland actually can sense light. It's close enough to the optic nerve that it can pick up light. And so the change in daylight triggers them to slow down or in some cases stop production in the winter time. Um, depending on the breed. Some breeds have been bred to produce more eggs and so they aren't as prone to stop laying um, as other like more heritage type breeds might be. So one way you're, if you want your chickens to lay more in the winter time, one thing you can do is change their lighting um, so that they have light a longer length of daylight using artificial lights on a timer. 
and I have a really good publication that I can put the link in at the end. Don't let me forget um, if you're interested in doing that. Okay, and one quick question, and we've got some other questions that probably will be for the end, okay. but since you talked about pigment, why do some chicken eggs have pigment? So that's completely based on genetics and breed. So different breeds have been selected. They've been bred specifically to lay eggs of different colors. So for example, these really copper colored eggs here, these are laid by what's called Morans. And there's all different varieties of Morans. And you have things like olive eggers and Easter eggers and Australorps that will lay blue or green eggs or even pink eggs in some instances. And then we have our standard brown egg laying hen. So that's completely based on breed and genetics. Okay, so this link here, and let me see, nope, goes forward. I was gonna see if I could copy it and put it in the chat, but I'll have to wait till we get to the end. It won't let me do it in the slideshow. Um, has a really cool poster detailing a lot of the shell abnormalities. It doesn't talk about all the internal ones, but it does talk about the shell abnormalities. And it's pretty cool. There's a digital poster you can download from that site too. So we'll make sure you get the link to that. So the first thing I want to talk about with egg abnormalities, I'm sure we've all experienced this, is blood in our eggs. You go collect eggs, you take them in the house, you crack them, and there's this big old blood spot in the middle of the egg. So what happened? What went wrong? So what happened was some blood vessels in the ovary, which has a lot of blood vessels in it, actually ruptured while that, while that yolk was breaking off from the ovary. Um, and created this little blood spot that then got wrapped up in the egg. Often what happens is that ova split where it wasn't supposed to. There's a spot on there called the stigma. So if we look really closely this yolk, we can see this line right here where there's not really any blood vessels in it. And that's the spot where it's supposed to break off at so that it doesn't create that big blood mess. But if it breaks off somewhere else, let's say it breaks off on a diagonal like this instead, you're probably gonna end up with some blood in there. So typically what happened, often this is, occurs in new hens, hens that lay are, are brand new to laying, maybe this is their first couple of eggs. Um, also excess lighting. So if we have turned on the lights so that our chickens will lay throughout the winter, but maybe we've caught a little overboard, we're giving them too much daylight and not enough dark time, that can cause that too. Or if we suddenly just change up their light schedule, instead of gradually increasing it, we just flip the lights on for an extra four hours a day. Um, that can also cause this. But sometimes it also just spontaneously happens um, for no, no real reason that we can determine. I want you guys to kind of pay attention as I go through some of these abnormalities. Pay attention to what the things that cause some of them. When we get to the end, I've got a couple questions for you about them. So double yolks, or in this case, triple yolks. So this isn't necessarily a bad abnormality other than it can make a hen more prone to being egg bound where she can't pass an egg, it got stuck because it's simply too big. Um, generally, this is you see this in new layers. Sometimes you see it in older layers that are nearing the end of their laying life. And some breeds are just naturally more prone to having this happen than others. And basically what happened was two yolks got released at the same time from the ovum and basically just came down together. What can also happen is what happened in this case, this was an egg that came down and was formed. And for whatever reason, it accidentally went backwards, back up, encountered this yolk, and went through the whole egg process again and became an egg within an egg. And I've had this happen. I've, I've only had one of these happen. Um, this is that triple yolker compared to a regular size egg. You can see how much bigger that is. So you can see how a hen might have trouble passing that egg, especially if she's a new layer. And this is a double yoked quail egg. Um, so you can imagine quail eggs are so tiny already to fit a double yolk in there. So the next thing is the opposite problem. These are called fairy eggs. They have a few other names as well. Um, these are these little tiny, this one's perfectly round. These little tiny eggs, often they don't have a yolk in them. Sometimes they do like this one here. This is actually that little green one that got cracked into a bowl. Um, but oftentimes they don't. Um, sometimes it's a little piece of tissue has broken off from the ova and, and the body thought that, oh, this is a yolk and, and went with it, even though it really wasn't um, a yolk. Um, usually, again, this is due to being a new layer. Um, you don't typically, you know, I get, you know, I get maybe one, uh, maybe two or three a year, maybe I get of these. It just sort of happens spontaneously. Um, these aren't really anything to worry about. I did see one case where somebody had a hen that had was consistently laying these. And that was probably a defect somewhere in her, in her system 
that was causing her to do that. Because um, it's not normal to see them frequently, but you do see them spontaneously occasionally. Rubber eggs or soft shelled eggs. This is something we get quite frequently. This one is a rubber egg um, where there's just no shell at all. It's just the membrane and that, that tough calcification layer on the outside just didn't happen. Um, generally, this is, again, those new layers. Um, you can think about the egg laying system kind of like an engine. It's got to get warmed up a little bit at first. And generally, the first few eggs that they put out um, can, can be not less than perfect. We can have some disruptions in the system, and this is one of them. This shell skipped the shell gland, egg skipped the shell gland and just got laid. So again, sometimes those new layers, um, some diseases, particularly avian influenza, Newcastle, bronchitis, there's also a disease called egg drop syndrome um, that can actually cause this to happen um, if you have it in your flock. Nutrition is a problem too, if they have not enough calcium or maybe too much phosphorus or something like that going on, um, that could be a problem. And the same thing with soft shelled, which is very similar, except that that calcification um, layer will just be really, really thin. And basically, as soon as you pick up the egg, you'll basically crush it. And that calcification layer will just crinkle up. Again, too much phosphorus, heat stress can also cause this. Like we see more of these in the summer months here in Arizona, um, just because those hens are often under heat stress and older hens. So if you see these occasionally, they're generally nothing to worry about. It's just a hiccup in the system that happened due to stress, heat stress. Sometimes it's just a oopsie. We made a mistake in the egg laying process. If you start to see them regularly, you should probably explore something that could be going on, one of these diseases or maybe a nutrition problem. Um, or if it's summer, it could also be heat stress. So Ashley, you're getting a lot of questions that we can answer in one fell swoop. All right, let's do it. Can you eat the bloody eggs, the fairy eggs, the vessel eggs? The... Right. Yes, so I actually do have a slide on that at the end. Okay. Um, the general rule on some of the, let, let's get through them. I promise sure. I have that on a slide. How about that? Sure. That way we can cover all the ones because I still have a couple more to go over, okay? Excellent. So mispigmented eggs. These are always fun ones. These are what happened. The egg got held up somewhere in the pigmentation or in the shell gland process, or maybe went backwards or maybe encountered another egg and got pushed up against it and got an extra coat of calcium on top of pigmentation. Um, these, that's generally what happened is it just got held up in the process somehow, usually stress. Maybe uh, her some other hen was in her favorite box and she couldn't go lay when she wanted to and she had to wait for that one box because we know they all lay in one box no matter how many you give them. Um, or maybe they got harassed by the dog and took, a, took an hour break from laying right at this time. Um, those types of things can cause this. Um, excess calcium, this one with the white spots, that's generally an excess calcium issue. And also changes in lighting. Um, if we're trying to adjust that lighting, again, we're just, we're messing with the timing of their, their tract here um, and things just got held up in the pigmentation process and we ended up with some extra weirdness going on. Corrugated eggs, so that is, that is not a soft shell. That shell is hard. It's, it's a normal egg shell. It's just got this wrinkly, crinkly, corrugated appearance. We often see this with heat stress, especially in older birds. Poor nutrition is a big contributor to this. And also because their um, they're egg whites, the albumin, the white part gets more watery and it, and it affects how the egg membrane forms around it and um, holds its shape, um, contributes to that. And then we also have what are called wrinkled eggs, which I don't have a picture of, they just get these little fine little wrinkles in them. Again, the, the shell is not soft, it's hard. Um, again, caused by stress, it could be caused by a, a hen with bronchitis, um, and there could also be defects in that shell gland. So that, that part itself that actually lays the shell, the calcium on the egg, could have a defect in it. Misshapen eggs. These are eggs that are too big, too small. This one that's flat on the side, this one right here, what happened was he um, came down the duct and while he was um, still soft, he encountered another egg in the shell gland. And that's what flattened that one side of him before he got his calcification layer on. Again, it's a timing issue. So we often see it with changes in lighting, with stress, with new layers who are still getting their engine sort of warmed up, some of those diseases. This other one is way, you can see this egg is way too oblong. This person told me that their hen always lays eggs this shape now which is probably a shell gland defect that they just have at this point, either due to trauma, maybe they had an egg break um, or genetics. 
broken and repaired. So these eggs got broken while in the, in the tract and repaired in the shell gland. So they got broken in the shell gland, and then, but they were there long enough, they were able to be repaired and mended. Um, generally, this is stressed during the calcification process. Something happened to that hen um, that caused that egg to break. Maybe, again, the dog harassed her, she got chased by a predator, something like that happened that caused this to happen. Now this one, this is the only really bad one in here, okay? This is a lash egg. This is not a real egg. Do not try to eat this egg, okay? It is disgusting. It will smell terrible. It's really a big blob of pus, egg pieces, egg shell pieces. It's been floating up and down the tract. It's full of dead cells and all kinds of disgusting junk. This is due to an infection within the reproductive tract. This is not a good sign. If you have a hen that lays one of these, she has some sort of serious infection in her reproductive tract. These are usually fatal. Some hens do recover. I have heard stories of them being treated at the vet with specific antibiotics and recovering and resuming laying normal eggs. Um, again, that's something you're going to definitely want to discuss with your vet um, to see. I think the antibiotics that they have to give them are um, prescription only. I don't know what the success rate is. I don't know if it's very high. Um, if you see this, this is very not good. Okay. So how do we prevent these abnormalities? So I hope you guys were paying attention to some of the causes of some of those egg abnormalities. And there were some themes going on within all of them. Can you name me maybe some of those things that were, that were, the, um, that were the main things that you noticed? There was many stress. Yes, stress was a big one. Stress, heat, new layers, yes. Nutrition, good, good job. Yes, you guys got it. Sickness, disease, poor nutrition, lighting. Excellent, you guys were on the ball. Oh, come on, proceed. So how do we prevent most of these abnormalities? We make sure our hens have good nutrition, that we're feeding a balanced diet designed for layers that has enough calcium, but not too much calcium. We don't wanna overload them either. We wanna make sure that they have low stress, that they're not being harassed by predators, pets, anything else. Um, in the summer, especially those of us in Southern Arizona, we know what it's like to battle and fight that heat every year. We need to have some sort of heat abatement strategy in effect, whatever that works for our hens. We wanna make sure we're monitoring our lighting schedules. If we're providing supplemental light in the winter time, don't change that schedule rapidly. Adjust it slowly over time to get to the point we want. And don't let me forget to drop that link. Monitor for disease, practice good biosecurity, and also recognize that some of these, especially like those rubber eggs, the fairy eggs, are just one-offs due to new layers. Um, maybe a hen took a break in laying because she went broody and now she's back to laying again and the first couple have some issues um, or if they're old birds. And in some cases, if you have a bird continuously laying the same type of shell, it could also be a genetic defect or injury, like a defective shell gland or something like that. So if they're just one-offs or nothing to really worry about, if you're getting them consistently, start looking into these issues and making sure that, um, that your, your program and your management is, is good. Hey, Ashley, I'm just gonna clarify because we're getting some comments and answers in the question and answer. So if, if Ashley's talking about throwing things in the chat, put it in the chat. Only oh, put yes. questions in the question and answer section, please. Thanks. That, that does help us keep, keep track of things a little bit better. Yes. So let's answer that egg safety question. So most of the abnormalities presented before are perfectly safe to eat. So if you have abnormal pigmentation, any of that kind of stuff, it's fine. The blood in there, if, you, if you're squeamish or sometimes maybe you get a little piece of tissue in there, you can totally just pick it out, it's fine. Um, it, it creeps me out, so I pick them out. You can actually whisk them in and you'll never even notice they're there. I pick them out, personal preference, but they're not gonna hurt anything. Now, obviously don't consume the lash eggs, they're not real eggs, they're disgustingness. And anything that is broken, so if something came out cracked or broken or with no shell, so those rubber eggs are those, shell, are those shell, soft shelled eggs and they got cracked, definitely don't eat those. Anytime, as soon as you've cracked that shell and cracked that membrane, you've allowed the possibility of introducing bacteria into the egg itself. Um, so we definitely don't wanna eat those types of eggs, but as long as the shell is intact, even if it's weird shaped or miscolored or whatever, it's fine. Finally, only consume eggs that are clean. We wanna make sure we're not eating eggs that have a lot of poop or feces on them. Consistently dirty eggs are not normal. If your eggs are not clean all the time, like um, I maybe get one egg 
one egg a week out of 13 hens that needed, um, that was too dirty that I wouldn't eat. It happens as an oopsie sometimes. Um, check for parasites and nutrition problems. Make sure your chickens aren't having really loose droppings, um, that they don't have matted and dirty feathers around their vent from those loose droppings. If they do, you can clean them up. You can give them a little chicken bath and wipe, wipe it off. You can also uh, just trim those feathers right there around the vent area. Don't trim too much. You don't wanna encourage other birds to pick at them, but you can trim a couple of the grossest ones off if you need to. And also the big one I see is make sure your chickens are not sleeping in the nest boxes at night. Nesting boxes are for eggs, roosts are for sleeping, okay, because they poop quite a bit um, while they're sleeping as they process the food that they've been eating during the day. Uh, they pretty much just sleep and poop all night. So. so let's move on to that egg safety, finish up this egg safety, I guess. The other thing we want to do to make sure that our eggs are always safe to eat, pick those eggs up in a timely manner, ideally daily. Um, and in the summer temps, two or three times a day, if you can get out there to get them before they get too warm. Um, it's hot out there. Um, it's, it's not good to leave them laying out there too long. Um, if you're purchasing new chicks or hens, buy them from a reputable hatchery, preferably one that's nat National Poultry Improvement, Improvement Project certified. Those hatcheries um, are certified. That means that they're testing regularly for things like salmonella and other and E. coli and other types of bacteria to make sure that that's not present in their chicken flock. So as long as you're buying birds that are from those certified flocks, you're not bringing in salmonella or other diseases that you don't want in your eggs into your flock. Um, be very cautious with any medication or treatment that you're giving to your hens, whether you're warming them um, or, or treating them for some disease. Make sure that the products that you're using are labeled for use in laying poultry and that you're following all those labeled directions. Remember, you're gonna be eating the final product out of these hens. You're going to be eating those eggs and you don't want to be eating something that's contaminated with a product. The reason you don't want to use a product that's not labeled is because the withdrawal time may not be tested or have been established for when it's safe for you to begin consuming eggs again after you've given it. Definitely consult a vet if you need to to make sure that the products you're using are safe. Um, and having that vet client patient relationship ahead of time is really, really helpful. It may be a small price to pay up front to pay them to come out for a one time consultation. It should be a relatively inexpensive exam visit. After that, they'll know your flock, they'll know your birds, they'll know you. And if you call them and say, hey, I got a chicken down, she needs antibiotic, whatever, they can actually probably call in the prescription over the phone because at that point you have a relationship with them. So that really helps you down the line. So really think about doing that. If you have a, a livestock vet already coming out um, for other species, pay them an extra couple of bucks to take, um, take a quick look at your chickens and, and that way you'll have them set if you have a problem down the road. And the final controversial question that we always get, to wash or not to wash my eggs? So it's controversial, but here's some guidelines. Number one, um, if you have an egg that's just got a little bit of, of dirt or whatever on it, dry wiping or brushing off eggs is 100% safe. It's totally fine to do that. Don't try to wash exceptionally dirty eggs. If they're coated in manure, the big smear of feces on one side, I wouldn't even bother. It's not worth your, it's not worth it. It's not worth the risk. When in doubt, throw it out. Um, if you do have an egg that maybe needs a little bit of a wash up, use warm running water, not cold. Don't dip them in water. Don't soak them in water. Um, don't put them in standing water. Use running water. You can use a brush and an egg safe detergent if needed. Be very careful with anything that you choose to use. Remember that those shells are porous and they will pull in anything and you don't want your eggs tasting like soap or lavender or whatever else. Dry them thoroughly, and after you've washed them, you do need to refrigerate them because you've washed that bloom off the shell. So it's your choice if you choose one way or the other. There's a lot of research that shows that washing eggs um, does make them um, less prone to having bacteria if it's done properly, but that washing eggs incorrectly is actually worse than not washing them. So just follow these guidelines. Um, and do note that if you are somebody who's selling nest run eggs in Arizona, meaning you are selling eggs by the carton under a nest run producer's license from the Arizona State Department of Ag. And if you're not, you should be, that's free. All you have to do is register. Um, you are not allowed to wash your eggs. So just keep that in mind. If you're in another state, I know there's a lot of you on here from other places, check with your state's Department of Ag for their rules. Finally, if you're hatching chicks, and I know there's some people on here that asked about that. Um, if you are hatching chicks and you're selecting eggs for that process, there's a few tips I have for you. Number one, just as before, make sure your hens are healthy, make sure they have good nutrition, that they're free from stress. Um, select eggs from hens that have been laying for at least a few months. Avoid those new layers. Give them a chance to let the system iron out all the kinks. 
before you start selecting eggs that you're going to hatch for new chicks. Make sure that you're picking eggs that are fresh, preferably less than seven days old when you're putting them in the incubator. Um, and they need to be as clean as possible. We really prefer not to have to wash them. Um, if, if you really are sold, I must hatch this egg and it's a little bit dirty, wash it carefully as gently as possible because that's better than introducing bacteria into your incubator. Um, you wanna make sure you're picking eggs that are as close to normal as possible. Don't use the abnormal shells, don't use abnormal shapes. Don't use ones you suspect are double yolks. They probably will not hatch and you'll end up with either something that hatches and is weird or can't get out of its shell or has a myriad of problems. Just pick eggs that are as close to normal shape as possible. Um, do note that morans tend to have a round on both ends, which is normally something we would say don't select for, except in the morans, that's pretty a pretty normal shape for them, so that's fine. Um, and finally, don't use eggs that are cracked or overly porous. A candle, use that bright light and look through them to check for that. Um, if they're cracked or overly porous, that's gonna allow bacteria in um, to contaminate the chick before it's fully incubated. And that's definitely something we wanna avoid. And with that, I have finished. Special thank thanks to everybody who provided me all those fun pictures of abnormal eggs and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Graham who gave me the pictures of the, um, the ovaries and the reprotract. Okay, so we have a boatload of questions. So what I want to do to make sure that Josh and his volunteer don't get left out in the dust is go ahead and do the presentation for the 4-H. And I think, so Josh, you can share your screen and unless you have problems, then I can share it. Um, can you enable me to share my screen? I think I need to promote him to a co- Okay, we'll get you. And then we will be able to answer questions and then if we run over, we're not um, leaving Josh and Jill in the in the dust, in the chicken dust. Um, let's see, it's not letting me promote him to a co-host and I don't know why. Okay. Maybe you well, need to do it. While I figure that out. Um, oh, wait, here we go. Okay. There we go, thanks. I just enabled the panelists to share, so you should be good now. Okay. Can we also promote Jill to a panelist? Yes. Jill is a panelist. I did promote her. Okay, awesome. Jill, are you able to get on? She's, she's listed as a panelist. Are you? Yep. I see that, yeah. Huh. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and um, I, for some reason, I don't know if she has audio capabilities, but if not, uh, we were connecting. Looks like oh. she's connecting now. Awesome. Okay. okay. Um, so Jill, uh, my name is Josh Moore. I'm the one of the 4-H agents in Pima County. Uh, I get the fun job of working with the poultry crew uh, down here. And we have a very robust uh, poultry program in Pima County. Um, we have a whole slew of very dedicated uh, project leaders um, that are extremely knowledgeable as far as poultry. And I asked um, Jill, who in our county, we have a system of project coordinators. Jill is our project coordinator um, to help me out with this because she knows the project best. and um, I'd like to think that we try to do as many uh, projects as possible in terms of um, getting people involved with poultry production. And in the four and a half years that I've been here, it's been uh, really awesome to be able to see the poultry project grow. And it's been awesome to see uh, members from across Pima County um, excel in raising birds and exploring different types of birds to raise for different purposes. Um, and a lot of that is testament to um, the members who are willing to try new things and the project uh, and volunteers who are willing to help them with that. So um, with that being said, we can just go ahead and jump right in. Um, right. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you now, Jill. Oh, super, great. It takes me a bit to figure it out. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself, Jill? Sure. My name is Jill Palmenberg. Um, I went to U of A and have um, agriculture background. Um, double major. I have plant science and soil science, and then I have a master's in agronomy from the University of Maryland. Um, but my day job, I work in pharmaceuticals, so I'm working on some COVID stuff and fun stuff like that. But um, my passion has always been ag, so I was so excited when my kids joined 4-H because then I started getting involved in poultry and and that's how I ended up where I sit right now. Um, so I just want to share with you some of the, um, the projects we have in, in Tucson. Um, I think we have a pretty big program. Um, I, I've heard rumors that we have one of the largest, like one of the top five programs in the country. Um, when I joined the program, we had about 100 and I think uh, 150 birds at the fair that year. 
Um, we're up to 650 birds at the fair now, and um, it's still growing. And so we have to have two judges. But I thought I'd share what, what our program looks like here in Tucson. So um, every person that participates in our program has to show a chicken. That's kind of our great equalizer. And that ensures that everybody learns things um, like this, this presentation. I'm so excited about it. I can't wait to share it with our, our poultry kids and you know anybody that didn't join. But every member shows a, a chicken in the poultry project. But we have other projects available too. Um, we have waterfowl and we have turkey showmanship and waterfowl, um, they can pick any, any kind of duck they want or a goose or whatever they want to do and they can show that for showmanship. Um, but it's primarily for educational and exhibition purposes. Um, what we found is most people don't get to come in contact with a lot of animals, um, which is kind of funny to me because I've always had animals, but it's just so interesting when you have your bird out and someone walks up and says, what is that? And it's really cool to watch the kids interact with, with the public. Um, Turkey is another um, showmanship that we do for exhibition and educational purposes. They can use ornamental or commercial turkeys. And um, the showman showing of these animals is a little bit different. Um, there's, there's different ways to show turkeys. Um, it can be shown kind of what I like to call on the hoof, which is walking around in the, the ring or it can be shown on the table. So um, there's different, different options there. Next slide, okay. Um, production opportunities. Um, one of our um, oldest projects is the Heritage Meat Pen. We pull a pen of, together of three similar birds and these are heritage birds that are like your barred rock or something like that. Um, most of the birds are, are dual purpose. That means they lay eggs or um, they can be used for meat. Um, uh, most, when, it's funny because when I started this with um, with poultry, the Heritage Meat Pen Project was only male, a pen of three males. Now it has progressed to be a pen of three females sometimes because we found last year in the COVID crisis um, when we had fair that people were interested in, in uh, laying hens. So um, the pens that were the Heritage Meat Pens that are typically meat, they used them for eggs. So that was a really popular project last year. Um, we order these birds at the county level or the kids, if some of the kids hatch and use their own stock. And so we've um, created um, an award for, for kids that use hatch their own birds because it's, you know, it's a lot more work. Um, these birds are cage or table judged. Um, they're raised, like I said, for meat or egg qualities. And they are, if it's a, if they're, if it's a pen of three males, they're harvested at the end of the project unless the pen is used for egg production. Um, Cornish Rock Cross meat pens. These birds, um, they're the, the birds you see at Costco in those little domes. Um, the rotisserie birds, that's the quickest and easiest way to get that in your mind. Um, these kids, a lot of kids buy 15 to 20 from a hatchery. They raise um, all of those and then they pick out a pen of three that are similar. Um, these are ordered at the club or family level um, and they're caged and um, table ju judged. They're raised for production only, and they are harvested at the end of the project. And mostly these birds are, it, it are fair, they're four to six weeks old, and they're ready, you know, you can eat them at that point. Um, the commercial turkeys, this uh, on the left hand side of the picture here, um, this is one of our commercial turkeys. These are really neat birds because they, um, they can be 55 pounds, that's how big they get. Um, our birds don't get that big. In Tucson, Arizona, it's just too hot and not safe for them to live that long, honestly. So um, our birds are about 16 weeks old when we process them at the end. But for this project, we order them at the county level. They get a pen of two or three birds. And then um, everybody starts out with the same genetics at the start. They raise them and then they choose their best bird to bring to the fair for market. And these are sold at auction. Um, this gentleman here, um, he was actually showing his bird in this picture. And that's how they're, they're um, judged is, is in the ring. And um, they are harvested at the end of the project as well. Next slide. 
one of the earlier pro the most recent projects, excuse me, uh, that we've started is the commercial duck project, which has been just really popular and kids really like it. Um, the, on the first slide, you saw a pen of four birds there. Um, that gentleman, he raised some really gorgeous birds that year. Um, we order these at the county level too from a hatchery and we um, start with a pen of three or four birds. Um, everybody has the same genetics to start but um, the kids raise their birds as they, as they choose and then they bring them to fair, um, a pen of two, and that's what is judged. And these birds are judged in the cage or on the table and they are harvested at the end of the project. Um, we also have a, a production opportunity that is a, the commercial laying hens. This was one of the first projects that I started in the poultry project um, when I um, joined. And what we do is we order at the county level again, a, a pen of five um, for each person that's interested in participating. Um, and then they choose at the end, they choose their best three and they bring them to the fair. And this project, it's really fun because the public loves this project. These birds are wildly um, popular at the auction. And um, we put a big bowl or a jug, a clear clear milk, milk jug um, on top of their cage and every egg they lay when they're at fair goes into that and people are just blown away that they can see that bird laid those eggs and it's just really fun. Um, these birds are judged on the, in their cage or on the table and they're evaluated for egg production. Um, there's a lot of ways that these birds have to be reviewed to see if they're really laying eggs. And um, so we do hire judges that are educated in this. Um, there's a difference in their pelvic bones. Their legs are different colors. Um, sometimes you can see differences with their wings. And that's how you know that the birds are actively laying eggs. Um, if, because clearly the judge can't see them laying eggs when they're sitting there at fair. <laughs> um, and one of the other projects we do is utility quail. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to a, um, a, a fair or to a, um, uh, what, what am I searching for here? The, the farmer's market, um, lots of quail eggs. I see quail eggs all over the place and some of the specialty meat markets I see, um, I see quail, quails available for sale there for meat. So we start with um, a pen of um, five to six birds and we order them at the county level or we've reached a point now where some of the kids um, hatch their own stock, um, or they'll reach out to someone, you know, locally or, you know, in a couple counties away and, and, and hatch their own birds out. Um, they bring a pen of three birds to the fair that are cage or table judged. And this is a great project because if they have a, if they end up, you know, it's hard to tell what you're going to get when you hatch these things out. Um, so if you get a male and two females, that could be a breeding pen. If you have a set of three females, that's a laying pen. And then if you have a set of three males, then that's a meat pen. So this, this project's super flexible. And the other thing about it is it's great. Quail can live in cages and they don't, they don't really care. They're very busy. They do what they do. And um, they're very happy to live in a cage. Um, they can live inside. So this is a great option for kids that want to be in our project, but don't have a lot of space. All right, we have about three minutes left, Jill. And so if you want to talk about ornamental birds, I can take the rest. Sure. Um, one of the other um, options in our program, is, um, this includes turkeys, which are the heritage turkeys, not those white commercial turkeys. Um, heritage turkeys can reproduce on their own. So that's how we define that out. Um, this, there's quail included in the ornamental section. These would be like button quail and things that wouldn't be used for production. Pea fowl, which would be your peacocks or your pea hens. And pheasants, there's so many really neat birds that can fit in this, in this uh, ornamental classification. And these are really for exhibition only and they are judged in the cage. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jill. I think that there's probably some questions that we can answer, but I'll go through really quickly. Um, one of the things that I'd highly encourage, and I know that not all counties require this, but if you're a poultry project member, I'd highly recommend that you take the YQCA class, the quality assurance class. Um, 
although uh, quality assurance in the past was geared more towards large livestock, a lot of those skills transfer over to raising um, small stock as well. And biosecurity is extremely important when raising poultry. So um, if you haven't taken a quality assurance class, please be sure to do that. Um, it's a great opportunity and you can take it online as well. Um, so in addition to your 4-H project leaders, um, I'd encourage you, I, obviously, once uh, the world gets back to a, a more normal um, setting, I'd highly encourage you to consider going to shows not only within your county, but maybe also outside of your county as well, because that'll expose you um, to um, the what different people and how they show, different styles, and also help you um, build networks where if you're looking for birds, you might make a friend outside of your county um, that will allow you to, you know, uh, be able to uh, make those connections. So some shows within Arizona are uh, the Colorado River Small Stock Show. Um, Gila County has an open small stock show. Uh, Pima County, we have a fur and feather show every November. Um, and there's also the Apache County show. Um, those are just four that I could think of off the top of my head. And I highly encourage you to check those out because uh, that's a great opportunity, as well as it's a good idea to get involved with um, your local adult, maybe. Um, so for example, in Tucson, there's a couple of different groups that are uh, adult, adult enthusiasts in poultry, and they are great resources with helping you find quality birds. I know there's a lot of questions about hatcheries to use, um, and it's those personal connections that you can make with people who are active in the poultry show world that can really help you out. And I know that um, a lot of our volunteers in Pima County are very active um, in poultry showing, and um, we rely on their connections that they make and their expertise, um, and they, they have a lot to share. Um, so in addition to that, the last thing that I, I um, did want to mention is that the poultry project, if you don't participate already, I'd highly encourage it. Um, it's a great uh, project that you can do um, within city limits in most cities. Um, and when you go to these shows and you go to county fairs, I highly encourage you um, to remember that as an exhibitor, um, it's your opportunity to kind of share the world what you're doing and what you're learning from this project. And one cool thing that happened um, with Pima County 4-Hers is a city council member actually came to our county fair and had the chance to talk with poultry members um, from our 4-H uh, clubs. And they actually, when they were coming up with city ordinances, um, that city council member utilized their experience with a 4-H member uh, to change city ordinances to make it easier for 4-H um, kids to raise chickens uh, in their backyard. So um, it's one of those things where we have a huge and profound impact um, that we can make in our community, the whole civic engagement piece um, by just doing what we love and doing it well and sharing our stories. So um, that concludes, I think we're at six, seven o'clock now. So um, I'll turn it back over uh, to Betsy. And if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna put my email and I'll put Jill's email inside of uh, the chat box. So thank you. All right, well, thanks for a great presentation, Jill and Josh and Ashley. And so I know that we have a boatload of questions in the question and answer. And I know that some go towards uh, Josh and Ashley can answer some and maybe Ashley Jeff for sample can pop in as well. She's nodding no. <laughs> so Ashley, Josh, Ashley Wright, Josh, you wanna just start at the top of the questions and take some? I might sure. defer to Jill on some of these too though. <laughs> yeah, sure. Do, do we want to go ahead and do those? I saw a couple that I think are really for you and um, for Jill. Do you want to do those ones first real quick? Sure. Um, let me try. Um, you want to read them? Sure. Uh, what does it mean order at the county level? Does that mean kids need to get their own birds? Do they get them through the county? How does that work? Um, so so, happens, oh, go ahead, Jill. I was going to say, I um, what I do is I send out an, an email with um, asking about interest. And um, the interesting thing that I've found out this year, usually um, I have somebody that helps me order things. Um, we do order certain things from hatcheries, um, but it's funny because I found out this year that most places don't hatch out the heritage meat bins after September. So um, I had to, I ordered fairly late and it was really hard to find um, what we were looking for. But um, people tell me, you know, I, I reach out and I say, hey, who's interested in doing the um, commercial turkey or who's interested in the commercial ducks or the utility quail, whatever it is. And then people just email and say, yeah, my, both my kids want to do the project. One child wants to do the project. Um, and then they, like, if it's a heritage meat pen, they tell me what kind of bird they're interested in. And I do my best to find that. And what happens is we bring them all into the county in um, we, we bring them to one volunteer's house 
he um, gives them a couple of days to settle out from being sent through the mail. That's how the chicks come. And then um, he reaches out to me and says, okay, they're ready for pickup. And then we um, distribute them. So um, in the past, when we were trying to get the projects um, populated and, and get interest up, the birds um, were donated, but um, this year we've um, had a $5 fee for each bird, which is very reasonable because the birds cost between um, five and eight dollars and then the shipping is um, typically around a hundred dollars. So. Okay, I know we got a boatload of questions. So let's go ahead, let's keep moving. Okay, um, I've seen this question pop up two places. Two people have asked it so really quickly. The chicken behavior question, so I'm going to be really quick. Why do my bigger chickens pluck my smaller chickens and how do I make it stop? So a lot of times it's overcrowding. So if your pen is too small, Sometimes it's that your little chicken is at the bottom of the totem pole and what sometimes is the best thing to do is to figure out which chickens are the bully chickens, which are the doing the picking, pull them out, house them completely separately for a couple of weeks so that all the other chickens forget who they are, and then reintroduce them and they will sometimes be pushed down to the bottom of the totem pole and that will solve a lot of picking behaviors. The other thing you need to do is if your little chickens are missing all their feathers, it's not a bad idea to pull them aside until those feathers all grow back because they'll keep picking at the little nibbins as they grow in um, and they won't stop. So you got to let them get a chance to get their feathers back in before they go back with the group. Okay. So I hope that helps. It's a couple of just a couple of quick things that might help you. Okay. And um, Ashley, can you find your link that you are going to share? And Josh, maybe you grab a question. Um, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to find one. Here's one, um, Josh. A question is, are members that are doing the heritage level projects and raising non-utility quail or pheasants required to get a live wildlife permit from the game and fish department? No. No, no, no permits are required. Everything we raise is typically from um, people that they're, they're birds that have been raised in captivity so they're not like we plucked them out of somebody's backyard um, um jill do you want to talk about uh, so raising your own feed in terms of like grubs and larvae um, different types of worms sure sure um that was one of the things i've tried to get started here in this county but it's just a little bit difficult for me to find um, somebody that can put together a kit um it's it's um something that we we looked into it's it's interesting you can do um we've done we've tried mealworms we've tried um sprouting and um fermented food and all three are very successful and they really um it cuts down on the amount of feed that you have to um give your birds and it, they're much healthier okay so just an update and then ashley right we'll come back to you popping through some questions uh, the link about lighting in the winter time has been put in the chat by Ashley Wright, and it's extension.umaine.edu, and you can see that in there. So go for some more questions there, Ashley, and make sure you guys check done when we've answered them. <laughs> okay, uh, I've heard you can't use eggs from home chickens for all the same purposes as store-bought. Is this true? It's not true. Um, if you have eggs from the store, eggs from the house, from your home chickens, you can use them for the exact same things, no trouble at all. Um, the big thing is the storage. Remember, those store-bought eggs have all been washed, which I think that was another question on the list. And as long as, and so they need to be in the refrigerator. Your home-raised chicken eggs do not need to be in the refrigerator unless you have washed them, and then they need to be in the refrigerator. Okay. Um, I can take one now. Um, there was a question about hatcheries, um, where to buy chicks from. Uh, I would just caution when you're looking for hatcheries, uh, depending on what you're trying to raise your chickens for, um, and depending on you know what what project you're raising, you you want to avoid doing things like uh, sometimes people will go to like Tractor Supply and buy chickens from there. Those may not be able to stand up to a breed show that's using a standard of perfection. So it really depends um, on where you want to go. And Jill, could you give us an example of a, a, a hatchery that you utilize? Sure, we've done, um, oh gosh, see I use different ones for different um, different orders. Um, we ordered our ducks from Metzer Farms because they specialize in ducks and they're out, um, out west here, um, closer to Tucson. Um, yeah, you, it, it really depends on what you're looking for to, to in order to, to know what you'll, you know, to, to get. <laughs> Sorry, I know that sounds crazy, but 
Okay. If somebody's looking for something specific, they could send me an email and I could help help out with that. Okay, you could put your email in the chat if you'd like. Ashley Wright, you're up. <laughs> All right, how do they get too much phosphorus? So as long as you're feeding a balanced diet, that's probably gonna be fine. One of those balanced layer rations, those sorts of things. Typically too much phosphorus can come from a couple sources, an excess of soy, an excess of certain types of grains, or it could be found in the water supply. Usually if I see it, it's because somebody is trying to mix their own home ration and they're not doing it correctly. Um, it's very important that we balance those minerals um, and everything else. So that's why I always recommend if you're trying to home balance your own ration, definitely make sure you know what you're doing or you get some help with it or feed a commercial ration that's um, been pre-done for you. Okay. Is there a reason that a hen never lays? Yes. Um, sometimes it's just poor genetics. Um, I had one that got sick and after she recovered, she never laid again. Um, anything that stresses them. Also, when they get old, they eventually run out of eggs. They only have so many in their ovary. They don't make more. When they're gone, they're gone. Okay, and Jill, it, uh, it looks like you got an email address from Gabe in the chat. And so what happened, another question, what happened when an egg, an, an egg is in the neck? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about here. I don't think that's an egg. I think you're talking about what's called the crop, which is a part of their digestive tract. It's a big sack that hangs right here on the side of their neck. When they eat, they fill that crop up and then it empties down into the gizzard where all the digestive stuff happens. Um, that big full crop is just a sign that they're eating. So as long as when they go to bed at night and they wake up the next morning, that crop is empty, everything is fine. If that crop gets really big, full and pendulous, they could have an impaction or something like that going on. If they have really foul, nasty breath, that's usually sour crop. But as long as that crop is filling and then emptying sort of regularly, um, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do and it's totally fine. Okay, next, how do we keep chickens from sleeping in the nest box? Nest boxes need to be lower than your roosts. So try to keep your nest boxes fairly low to the ground and make sure your roosts are up really high and that they have a way to get up to them. They prefer to sleep as high as possible. Um, and you may need to retrain them if they've been sleeping in the boxes. You may need to go out there before bedtime and block the boxes off and force them to go to the roosts for a few nights um, so that they learn that they're supposed to be sleeping on the roosts, not sleeping in the nest boxes. Okay, why not wash with cold water? Why warm? Uh, those eggshells are really porous. And so if um, the egg is room temperature or warm, which it probably is when you've collected it, when you go to wash it, if you shock it with that cold water, that inside membrane will shrink up. It will actually suck water, bacteria, and anything else on the outside of the shell into the egg. So you want to use water that is slightly warmer than the egg that you are washing. Okay. How can I tell if my chicken may be having heat stroke or having issues with the heat? Arizona gets pretty hot. We know hey, that. There's, there's a really good article on this. Um, if I get a break, I will try to find it for you. Um, but basically chickens don't, don't sweat. So you'll see them, they'll start, the first thing they'll do when they start getting hot is panting. Then they'll start standing with their wings out. They're cool in their pits. That helps a lot. That chicken is fine. Now, if they start doing that and sort of sitting very still and listless, um, kind of hiding in the corner, um, they'll, they'll maybe be like really kind of droopy and pale. That's a chicken that's going into heat stroke and is going to need some help. Um, generally dip them in cool, not ice cold, cool water um, and bring them in the house till they're dry and cool and everything else will take care of that. Um, fans, misters, making sure they have shade and cool water and um, ice in their water if you can, like big ice blocks and stuff. Any of that kind of stuff can really help keep them cool in the summertime. Okay, so real quick, Josh put it in and then I just put it in again. If you want the list that Jill offered, email her directly at PimaCountyPoultry at gmail.com. That is in the chat box. Next question. I think you already answered why not, why don't you want to wash your eggs, right? Yes. Okay, and then are there any resources to find shows in specific areas? Josh, you already put a link in there, didn't you? Uh, I didn't put a link, but uh, I can share my, I don't know if there's a way to share my slides. I can list the ones, um, uh, the ones that I listed. Go for it. Okay. Um, let's see. What happens if your meat birds get so big, they break their legs? Are they disqualified? Uh, in Pima County, they do have to be able to stand on their own in good health. So yes, that that is correct. And that's why we have age limits too, because once, if they get too big, if you're feeding them too much, they will have that problem. So we try to keep our birds between four and six weeks old um, for the um, Cornish rock crosses because they're the ones that typically have that issue. So just watch what you're feeding them. They cannot eat 24 hours a day. That's really bad. 
Okay, and Josh is answering the poultry at the fair question typing that. So we'll go on to the next. What is the best commercial feed? This is a loaded question, huh? It's a, it's a very loaded question and it depends on what works best for your birds. So, and your goals of your operation. If you have laying hens versus if you're growing pullets versus if you've got those meat birds that you're raising up for the fair, just make sure that you pick one that is designed for that purpose um and that you can get regularly that you can get clean you know make sure it's not one that's sitting at the feed store getting old and that kind of stuff and as long as it's working for your birds and it's a balanced diet from a reputable mill you're in good shape okay and so just a note ashley just put heat stress and chickens link so there's a link in the chat regarding the heat stress and chickens go grab that and next question how long do you need to leave a rooster with a hen to get a fertile egg about two seconds <laughs> um, just the roosters generally just live with the hens and they'll they'll pretty much start doing their job as soon as they're old enough and and decide that they're happy enough to start breeding hens okay i see josh is asking answering a question typing for uh june so kanan asked how does the yolk form okay so the yolk is remember it's on that ovary so you have those little tiny follicles and those will grow those there's actually a whole sequence of hormones that are released um, luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone and those actually stimulate those to start growing and forming that little yolk right there on the ovary and it's it's really um composed a lot of things like cholesterol i know we talk about cholesterol with eggs um cholesterol and fatty stuff and, and other nutrients like vitamin a and things that are in there so that that chick um, can use them to develop. So it's a it's a pretty involved process for them to actually develop that yolk and to grow that thing right there. That you see that network of blood supply that was on there. That's all blood supply. There's a whole bunch of blood vessels in that in that ovary, bringing all those nutrients into that yolk so that it can grow and, and take the things it needs from blood to develop and become big enough to support an embryo. I hope that made sense. Okay, um, I so Josephine will finish our questions. So if you're still here, cool. If not, thank. Then we'll see you next time. I'm sure. So um, got one more here. What is the best type of feed for waterfowl ducks specifically? Is chicken feed okay for them? Some of my duck legs gave out and they couldn't walk on them. They weren't broken. Josh, do you do ducks? I don't really do ducks. I don't. Do yeah, they need to be fed um, something called all flock. That's really the best feed for them. Um, we sometimes add a little bit of extra protein in there. We feed them um, spinach, raw spinach. That's very good for them. And the other thing is there's, um, oh, I forget what it's called, but there's something with um, ground up garlic and something <laughs> in it that you're supposed to feed them. And that's to help keep the flies down. Um, but it also has something in it for um, making sure that their feathers form correctly. I, I'd have to look that one up because I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives a start. Hey, Josh, can you reshare your link for the show sources? And, uh, yes. And I think the question, can you eat a blood vessel? Yes, you can. It will not hurt you, but it's icky and I pick it out. <laughs> okay. um, I don't think we're doing any webinars on grading or judging eggs. I don't know if we have anybody with that expertise. I'll be honest with you. Um, unless, unless we decide to do one later because we find somebody. Um, how many yolks does a chicken start with or how many years does a chicken lay? So those are two different questions. So how many yolks does a chicken start with? Most, it's usually around 550-ish that she has that she'll lay throughout her entire lifetime. How many years it takes her to lay all those depends on how many eggs she lays per year. Your really high end layers are going to lay 300 plus eggs per year. So she's going to go through them pretty quickly. Your more heritage type breeds that lay fewer eggs per year, maybe 150 eggs per year, are obviously going to go through those a lot slower. And, um, and oh, and can chickens reconsume their shells for calcium if clean baked? Yes, they can. You can clean bake them and refeed them back. Um, oyster shell is another really good choice for calcium. Okay. And and also, we will be having another poultry session for turkeys, turkeys. And, and such. We have so, Dr. David Frame from Utah State is um, going to do a presentation on turkeys on March 18th. So if you guys are, are turkey people or you're thinking about turkeys, that would be a really good one. Okay. We also have ideal 
ideal suggested beginner bird? What's the easy, easy um, bird? I would say any, if you're doing showmanship, we always suggest that they use bantam birds because they're much smaller and it's easier to hold them in your hand. Um, but really chickens are just such great animals. They're all pretty easy. I wouldn't go for a rooster because sometimes they can get aggressive, but that's what my sons always picked was the big crabby birds. <laughs> they just loved them. So, yep. Okay, so Josephine, we've seen three or four or five times that you want a dog webinar, as we said the first time. We'll see, we'll see about it, but that'll be later if it does happen. So, All right. so. Last question. How many months does it take for the eggs to hatch? Less than one. It's about three weeks. Excellent. Uh, the swine is available. Um, the recorded, the one that we did for Gary, the swine link is available. Right now we do not have a second swine one um, scheduled. Okay, I think Katie is asking about a lonely chicken because some dogs got, if she's the one, some dogs got into her chicken roost and she has ah. one left. So uh, yes. I see what some do you do for a lonely chicken? So um, you probably should think about getting some more. Chickens are flock animals. They do like to live in a group. They do like social interactions. They're social birds. She will probably survive and learn to be fine on her own, but it would be better if she had some friends. Okay, holy smokes, Great. guys, I think you did it. We are way <laughs> over time, but you guys had some really great questions. Okay, so you've got the Ashley Jeffers sample just re put in the link for all the other websites as well, or other webinars as well. And if you are interested in whatever it was that Jill offered, Pima County Poultry at gmail.com, send her an email because we won't be able to go back through the chat and find your emails and know that you wanted that. And Tucker has come in to close the webinar. So you can he's had enough. He's been good. He's been a good boy for an hour and a half. <laughs> so we, we thank you so much for joining us. And we thank Ashley and Josh and Jill for presenting. And we will see you in a couple of weeks with beef. <laughs> <laughs>